Well, welcome to uh, Spiritual Seekers Question Answer, which uh, seems uh, similar, of course, to Vedanta uh, Series Question Answer. But the difference is, of course, for, it gives an extra opportunity to ask and answer questions, but also orientated more around spiritual practice itself. We start off anyway with a prayer for teacher and students. By now, you probably know it. You can join in. <clears throat> Om Sahana Avotu Sahana Obanaktu Sahaviryam Karvavai Tejasvinavaditam Astomavit Vishavai Om Shanti 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 that one protect us both, may that one nourish us both. May we work together with great vigor. May our study be illumined. May we not unnecessarily disagree with each other. Peace, peace, peace be on all. Well, as usual, I'll mute my microphone so that you can, if you wish, formulate a suitable question. Hi, Swamiji. Uh, can you can you speak uh, about um, Ishvara and uh, Brahman? And uh, so uh, the relation Brahman uh, give us the order of the things is more in the macrocosmos and um, Ish um, no sorry the opposite way Ishvara is the 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 global thing and we are in like when we are uh, i don't know very well how to explain <laughs> so i want that you talk a little about these two things and the the connection between us uh, brahman and uh, ishvara Okay, thank you. So that's a good question there. Okay, uh, I I have in front of me uh, Swami Vivekananda's lecture on Bhakti Yoga that I recommend in answer to your question. And so there's one chapter, and we can study it together. He writes the philosophy of Ishwar is exactly the answer to your question. And so I'm going to read out what he writes, and at the same time, make a commentary on it. So he starts off with a question. The question is, who is Ishwara? Janmadhyasya Yataha, from whom is the birth, continuation, and dissolution of the universe, is a question that is asked. He is Ishwara, the eternal, the pure, the ever free, the Almighty, the All-Knowing, the All-Merciful, the Teacher of all teachers. And above all, so Ishwaraha Anirva Chaniya Prima Swarupaha. He is the Lord of his own nature, inexpressible love. So that requires a little bit of a commentary. <clears throat> so we're living in a universe whereby we observe these three things as part of the continuation of life. We see birth, we see life, we see death. And one fundamental principle in our philosophy is that whatever happens here on the microcosm happens on the microcosm. Actually, it's not a new idea. It's not even particularly a Vedantic idea because Leonardo da Vinci, we'll see, uh, has this wonderful, wonderful diagram the universal man and symbolizing not only the individual human but also a cosmic version of it. And so we see in passages such as the Purusha Suktam 
that the universe is seen to be like a person. And like a person, it has a personality, it has a body, it has a mind. And so this Lord who operates this, who commands this body, this universe, which includes us, is described as a personal God. That is a God that lords it over. Ishwara, the very term, means the one that is the Lord. In other words, if we observe carefully, we'll see a certain rhythm in the universe. We'll see a certain, uh, a certain uh, mathematical precision within it. We will see that there are laws which govern it. And these laws are put into our best theories. General relativity, for example, is full of these laws. So uh, when we read these words, to my mind, it comes uh, the all merciful. See, these are words from the Quran. In the Quran, every surah begins with this, the all merciful, the all beneficent, and so on. All of these qualities are given. So when we talk about this uh, world, we also talk about the Lord who organizes it. With our conventional understanding anyway of God who is a creator, but more than that, not only a creator, but the one who sustains everything, the one who dissolves everything, the one who governs everything. And so he is almighty, all knowing, all merciful. In fact, he is always described in every religion as omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. Naturally, if there's anything to be known, he will know everything in advance. The teacher of all teachers, this is how Patanjali would describe Ishwara. Because you see, in Patanjali's Eightfold System, and uh, Niyam, he will say that you require to pasya some discipline, you require study, um, but you'll also require offering the fruits of all your activities to this Ishwara, and Ishwara is described as that great ancient teacher, teacher of all teachers. When we say, I know something, immediately we also understand that there's something outside that to be known more. And so he is the Lord. He's the Lord of what? Of his own nature. There are no two. There's no creator and creation separate. There's no Lord, governing Lord, and a, something that is objectively governed, separate. He is also inexpressible love. Why else would he freely give all of these things that we have, the universe itself, that contrives to make all the elements that we see now and the elements that make up the body as well as the objects that this body sees through the sense organs. So these descriptions, Swami Vivekananda continues, are certainly are the definitions of a personal God. Then the next question comes, well, so are there two gods then? Is there the not this, the not this, the neti neti described in the Upanishads, the sat chit ananda that is described, the existence, knowledge, and bliss of the philosopher, and also this God of love of the devotee Ishwara. And bulk of us are devotees. Devotee, devotion is a beautiful path suitable for this day and age where distractions are so many affecting all our emotions, we better take our emotions or emotional energy and rechannel it somewhere in a more delightful way. So are there these two things? Is there the impersonal and the personal? The personal, the impersonal and personal in one. It has always to be understood, he says, that the personal God worshipped by the devotee is not separate or different from the impersonal that is described as Brahman. 
It is just that Brahman has none of these characteristics except what we might describe as existence itself, not non-existence, consciousness itself, not dullness and bliss itself. Now, there's a current atheistic argument that tells us, you see, if there is a God, God must be extremely simple because of the second law of thermodynamics where entropy increases. So a God must be the most simple of the simplest things. And we know that the simplest things in life are the most stupid. They have no apparent consciousness. But you see, it's only because they're looking at things from purely a materialistic point of view. And so the simplest is actually not even one, not even two. When we talk about this, we talk about a system of Advaita, non-dualism, not monism, as is often referred to, because monism means one alone. But this is not even within the scope of mere morality. So we know it is existent. It's not that something came from nothing. And we know that this existence has come through to us in a basic way as a wish to live, a wish to exist, a wish to survive. The greatest fear that we have, mother of all fears, is the threat of non-existence. Non-existence with the inference having no meaning, etc., all of these things. And we know that Everything works on the basis of pure intelligence. And there is a consciousness itself. It's not a quality. And we know the great, great joy that is described. Yesterday we were talking about this Brahman described as Ananda, bliss. This bliss and the Tatiri Upanishad will go a little slightly different. It will tell us that it is Satyam, it is absolutely truthful, the only existent thing that is possible, that never changes. It is jnanam, that is knowledge, and it is anantam, anantam, infinite. Well, when you have something that is infinite, with no parts, with no aggregates, then you have absolute joy. You know yourself, when you are one, when everything is one, when there's no second to fight with, Things are peaceful. So all of these have to come through, have to be evidenced in life. And this evidence comes as in, in three forms, a threefold form. And so it comes out as existence that is a creation, a certain creation, creativity that continues with the universe and the individual organic components of it wishing, wishing to survive, wishing to perpetuate their existence through procreation. Creation and this procreation is there. And then of course, every, every single component in the universe seems to know what it's doing, it seems to know that it has to obey some laws, it doesn't move outside it even if those laws cannot really be fully understood. Every bacteria knows its boundaries. Every bacteria knows how to propagate every 20 minutes. Every bacteria knows how to absorb from a liquid environment uh, the nutrients that it wants, expel things that it doesn't want, the used components. It knows how to uh, absorb oxygen in some bacteria, aerobic bacteria will do it. And you can tell the rate of activity of bacteria by an oxygen uptake method. You take a, an inoculum, you shake it up, you put some oxygen in it, and then you close it off, and then you measure the rate of oxygen depletion, and you see an active, an active inoculum how active it is. In other words, the rate of oxygen is very, very quick. So this Satyajit Ananda comes through to us. Last night I was describing it, or maybe the other night was describing it really in terms of life, in terms of light, in terms of love. But love is there. 
there's no doubt. And so the expression of the Satyananda comes through as this God of love. So it has always been understood that the personal God worshipped is not separate or different from this Brahman. In fact, we can call it Saguna Brahman. That is not only lording it over, creating a certain rhythm and organization structure, making sure that the laws are not violated, actually creating the laws themselves. And making a universe that can be studied with the intelligence of itself. So everything really is only one thing. That's the fundamental thing in Vedanta philosophy. There is only one principle which we call Brahman. It comes from a Sanskrit root bra that implies something that is enormously potentially powerful, something that is expanding very rapidly. This could easily be described as a universe. So it is seen to be a source. So all is Bra Brahman. It is the one without a second. And only the Brahman as unity or absolute is too much of an abstraction, of course, to be loved and worshipped. Try worshipping, try conceiving even, of some entity outside of space, outside of time something that has no aggregates, no parts, doesn't occupy any form, and something that does not evolve in time, an unchanging entity. We can make an experiment. I've done it often before with you. So you can close your eyes and see, okay, let us now remove all things, all the whole of space. All of space must go. Now the nearest concept that we have to it will be to examine outside the borders of the earth and to go into the outer space, into the L2 regions, for example, and beyond, even beyond our galaxy, we can imagine, and see vast, vast areas of seemingly empty space. But even this emptiness is, has got some teeming aspect to it. We are told that there are various quantum fluctuations. It is not entirely empty. It's just that on average, it's empty. So almost nothing. The universe is extremely dilute. And so this, uh, this uh, aspect of it, we can't even imagine. Now we can't even imagine taking away time. You take away time, that means you take away all motion. We are a very dull world, but you won't even be able to see it because registering movement is what we're used to. And something changes and appreciation of time, and you may even say that time is a psychological relativity. It registers things which change in front of us. It gives us the opportunity to organize things, to separate things. It gives us an opportunity to understand things, give me time to think, we say, and so on. So we cannot imagine something as abstract as Brahman, no matter how much we try. It is not to be conceived of, except in this form of Ishwara. So how can we love and worship this impersonal Brahman? And so what we do is choose the relative aspect of this Brahman, that is Ishwara, and Ishwara is defined as therefore the supreme ruler. Now it's not that it's just a concept. It is an actual being, but it is within the framework also of Maya. And yet, unlike us, it is not deceived by Maya. It is the master of Maya. And so, to use a simile, he says, Brahman is as the clay or substance out of which an infinite variety of articles are fashioned. Now, he'll go on to say, you see, we can never ever be or become God. We can never become Ishwara. 
the great obstacle in Vedanta philosophy is a person who declares, I am one with God, I am God. This would be a falsehood because you cannot be one with Ishwara. That's impossible. You are one with Brahman. Yes, one with the substance, but the particular name and form that is called Ishwara, that's not possible. And so, as uh, clay, everything is one. All objects made from clay are clay. There is no two. But the form or manifestation differentiates all the objects made from clay. Before every one of them was made, they all existed potentially in the clay. And of course, they are identical substantially. But when they are formed, and so long as the form remains, they are separate and they are different. The clay mouse can never become a clay elephant. And be, because, uh, he says, as manifestations, form alone makes them what they are. Though as unformed clay, they're all one. So Ishwara is the highest manifestation of the absolute reality. Or in other words, the highest possible reading of the absolute by the human mind. Creation is eternal, and so also is Ishwara. Now there's a definition for Ishwara. If you want to substitute the word Ishwara for God, that's okay. But you see, when somebody asks, what is God? Do you have a definition of God? Here is a most profound definition. It says that Ishwara, or God, is the highest manifestation of the absolute reality, or in other words, the highest possible reading of the absolute by the human mind. Creation is eternal. What does that mean? You see, now in our cosmology, we have this theory of a Big Bang. Or creation moment, which is becoming extremely, increasingly difficult to reconcile with our observational evidence. All of a sudden, something happens. It doesn't work unless you have something called inflation, and the evidence for inflation is seen to be something like what a Kobe satellite goes and detects and sees that there is a monopole or a spike which turns out to be exactly what was measured, exactly comparable to black body radiation. And yet, you see, uh, its interpretation is, this is the cosmic microwave background left by an inflation in the Big Bang model. Now, it's only an interpretation, but our system says, if the whole of the rhythm of life is birth, life, and death. This dissolution which will take place eventually, or which is happening already locally, has to be renewed and will go on forever. This is a fundamental principle of our thinking, that there is no such thing as a one-off creation. And at every creation, naturally, at every new cycle or beginning of a cycle, or kalpa, then we have another, a new Ishwara going forth, a new creator. In the fourth part of the fourth chapter of his sutras, says Swami Vivekananda, after stating the almost infinite power and knowledge which will come to the liberated soul after the attainment of this moksha, which is our aim, this freedom, Vyasa makes a remark in an aphorism that none, however, will get the power of creating, ruling, and dissolving of the universe, because that belongs only to Ishwara, or God alone. And in explaining the Sutra, it's easy for dualistic commentators to show how it is ever impossible for a subordinate soul, that is termed a jiva, to have the infinite power and total independence of God. Now, the thorough dualistic commentator Madhva, Madhva Acharya, he deals with this passage in a usual summary way or method by quoting a verse from a certain Purana, Vraha Purana. And in explaining this aphorism, Ramanuja, 
says this doubt being raised now i have to explain the real key champions of these three systems are dvita vishishta dvita and dvita non-dualism qualified non-dualism absolute dualism these are championed typically by madhva for dualism ramanuja for vishishta dvita or sometimes called be the beta and then absolute uh, non-dualism is shankaracharya and so when we read these commentaries we get three flavors three interpretations of similar passages according to how you want to portray whether it is a dualistic world or a non-dualistic world or somewhere in between it's a bit like you see there's an ocean and a wave doesn't know that there's an ocean and the wave says i am a wave and i see other waves and we are all competing for space in our wave kingdom and we have heard that somewhere is an ocean we'll call upon the ocean when is necessary but right now we're occupied in dealing with other waves similar to me and then as we grow in our experience and our understanding as mother nature leads us on as our internal potential our internal drive that is the god within it expresses itself more and more in the adventure of life maybe in our spiritual development something occurs to us in our experience that there is a similarity it is not that we are absolutely separate waves but there's a connectedness every wave seems to have similar characteristics and somewhere no doubt these are manifested from an ocean and so there's a connectedness with the ocean itself this is ramaluja's vishishta dvita position until the absolute realization occurs i am the substance i'm not the name the form or i am the name of the form but i am the substance the name and form will change the substance that i am the ocean i am the ocean itself that erupts into various waves that comes about now the most subtle uh, author of these waves is what we call ishwara but ramaluja says this this doubt being raised whether among the powers of the liberated souls is included that unique power of the supreme one that is of creation etc of the universe and even the lordship of all or whether without that the glory of the liberated consists only in the direct perception of the supreme one we get as an argument the following it is reasonable that the liberated get the lordship of the universe because the scriptures say he attains to extreme sameness with the supreme one and all his desires are realized now extreme sameness and realization of all desires cannot be attained without the unique power of the supreme lord namely that of governing the universe we can never govern the universe therefore to attain the realization of all desires and the extreme sameness with the supreme we must all admit that those who are liberated get the power of ruling the whole universe this is his argument and to this we have to reply this seems to be a misunderstanding that the liberated get all the powers except that of ruling the universe ruling the universe is guiding the form and the life and the desires of all the sentient and the non-sentient beings the liberated ones from whom all that veils his true nature has been removed only enjoy the unobstructed perception of the brahman but do not possess the power of ruling the universe this is proved and scriptural text is quoted but how does it go it goes like this from whom all these beings are born by which all that are born live and to whom they departing return ask about it that is brahman 
Now, if this quality of ruling the universe by a quality common even to the liberated, then this text would not apply as a definition of Brahman, defining him through his rulership of the universe. The uncommon attributes alone define a thing. And therefore, in texts like My Beloved Boy alone, in the beginning there existed the one without a second. That saw and felt, I will give birth to many. And then that projected heat this is the description that we find in the Upanishads. Brahman indeed alone existed in the beginning. That one evolved, that projected a blessed form, the Kshatra. All these deities and gods, all these forms, all these powers, all these ex uh, expressions of divine glory are Kshatras. Varuna, Soma, Rudra, Parjanya, Yam, Mritya, Ishana. Atman indeed existed alone in the beginning. Nothing else vibrated. Now you now can ask the question, well, what's the distinction between Atman and Brahman? None, none whatsoever. When we refer to Brahman as within us and immanent in us, we call it Atman. And when we acknowledge the Absolute, then we call this Brahman. When we have discovered Atman, we have discovered Brahman. So the passage goes on. Atman indeed existed alone in the beginning and nothing else vibrated. He thought of projecting the world. He projected the world after. Now, how did the world come to be? He thought, let me. That thought was the projecting, uh, the projecting energy. Alone, Narayana existed, neither Brahma nor Ishana, nor the Dva, nor, nor the uh, Java, Prithivi, not the stars, nor water, nor fire, nor soma, nor the sun. He did not take pleasure alone. He, after his meditation, had one daughter, the ten organs, etc., and then others as who living in the earth is separate from the earth, who living in the Atman, etc. These are from the Upanishads. The Shruti speak of the Supreme One as the subject of the work of ruling the universe. Nor in these descriptions of the ruling of the universe is there any position for the liberated soul. By which soul, or by which such a soul, may have the ruling of the universe ascribed to it. Now, in explaining in the next sutra, Ramanu just says, if you say it is not so, because there are direct texts in the Vedas in evidence to the contrary, these texts refer to the glory of the liberated in the spheres of the subordinate deities. This also is an easy solution of the difficulty. And although the system of Ramanuja admits the unity of the total, within that totality of existence, there are, according to him, eternal differences according to him therefore for all the practical purposes this system also being basically dualistic it was easy for ramanuja to keep the distinction between the personal soul and the personal god very clear now he goes on to say so i hope you understand i hope you're following all this there are three approaches to this but it's quite clear that if an elephant is made from clay and another object is made from clay, let us say a cow, the cow form can never be the elephant form. But you see, Ishwara is not bound by anything. If you ask a pot, who are you? I use this example many times. It might say, I am clay. This is a knowing pot. An unknowing pot under the delusion of Maya will take its form and name seriously and say, I am a pot, my name is so-and-so. But the truth is, the pot is clay. Now, the delusion or the illusion, if you like, of the pot which says, I am the pot, we are subject to this. 
and this is called Maya. And Maya really is just a misunderstanding, a mistake, registering something uh, for what it's not. Registering in the example I gave you that the wave itself and the wave system is the only reality. Well, it's not. And the thing that is always present, the waves will vary, the waves will come, the waves will go. But you see, the ocean will remain the same. And when the first creative movement of the ocean comes about, this potentiality is called Ishwara, O God. And this text says before, even Brahma, the creator, what does that mean? Well, it means then that Ishwara is sitting there in a state of equilibrium and then erupts, erupts as a creative force. This creative force we call Brahma. And so Brahma then projects, it takes this thought and this thought, let me create and so on and so forth, manifests as all the various objects that we see. Vivekananda continues. He says, we shall now try to understand what the great representative of the Advaita school has to say on the point. We've heard from Madhva, we've heard from Ramanuja. So, we shall see how the Advaita system maintains all the hopes and aspirations of the dualist intact, and at the same time propounds its own solution of the problem in consonance with the high destiny of divine humanity. You see, there is no contradiction anywhere. How does it maintain all positions and yet uh, supplements them? Those who aspire to retain their individual mind, even after liberation, and to remain distinct, will have ample opportunity of realizing their aspirations and enjoying the blessing of the qualified Brahman. What is Ishwara? The qualified Brahman. What is Brahman? The unqualified Brahman. For this reason, two words are used. Nirguna Brahman, which is the absolute, and Saguna Brahman, that which has various qualities, or potentialities for qualities, a manifesting aspect of it. Unmanifested and the manifested. So now, um, these are those who want to enjoy the blessings, the qualified Brahman. These are they who have been spoken of in the Bhagavata Puran. And it's in this way. O King, such are the glorious qualities of the Lord that the sages, whose only pleasure is in the self, this is in the Atman, and uh, from whom all fetters have fallen off, even they love the omnipresent with the love that is for love's sake. Even after liberation, they still love that one for love's sake. These are they who are spoken of by the Sankhyas as getting merged in nature in this cycle, so that after attaining perfection, they may come out in the next as various governors or lords of world systems. But none of these ever becomes equal to Ishwara or God. Those who attain to that state where there is neither creation nor created nor creator, where there is neither nor nor noble nor knowledge, where there is neither I nor thou nor he, where there is neither subject, nor object, nor relation, there who is seen by whom. Such persons, persons have gone beyond everything to where words cannot go, nor the mind. Gone to that which the Shrutis declared as neti neti, not this, not this. But for those who cannot, that is, those who cannot have the keenness and dedication of the jnanis, those who cannot or will not reach the state, there will inevitably remain a triune vision 
of the one undifferentiated Brahman as nature, soul, and the interpenetrating sustainer of both, namely Ishwara. So in the story of Prasada, I'm sure you may all have heard of Prasada. Um, when uh, Prasada forgot himself, he found neither the universe nor its cause, all was to him one infinite undifferentiated by name and form. But as soon as he remembered that he was Prasada, there was the universe before him and with it the Lord of the universe, the repository of an infinite number of blessed qualities. So it was with the blessed gopis. Now, if you're not familiar with these stories, Prashlada, of course, was the son of Hiranyakshibu, the, uh, the great, great uh, demon, who was of the nature, an atheistic temperament, and was cruel and materialistic, and had nothing to do with God, but Prashlada loved, of course, Vishnu. And uh, so he was uh, tortured and by his father, so on and so forth. He would not relent. And, uh, but you see, when he was attuned properly to the Absolute, then the, uh, the one which was um, with form, the individual object of his love, the Ishwara, was not present and vice versa. Then also, the same thing with the blessed gopis, those who were loving Krishna, so long as they had lost a sense of their own personal identity and individuality, they were all Krishnas. And when they began again to think of him as the one to be worshipped, then they were the gopis again. And immediately uh, it, it happened. Unto them appeared Krishna with a smile as the verse, on his lotus face, clad in yellow robes and having garlands on, the embodied conqueror and beauty of the God of love. And anyway, he goes back to Acharya Shankara. Those, he says, who by worshipping the qualified Brahman attain conjunction with the supreme ruler, preserving their own mind, is their, is their glory limited or unlimited, is a question. And so that doubt would arise. Uh, we, can, we get as, a, as an argument, their glory should be unlimited. Because of the scriptural texts, they attain their own kingdom. I have to tell you that all these arguments, philosophical, uh, dialectical arguments, are all honoring the validity of the scripture, in this case, Upanishads. And so they're using this as a basis. And so in terms of, is it logical or what have you, that's being put aside and saying, we have absolute faith in the validity of the Vedas, in this case, the Upanishads. And so therefore, we have to quote those in order to support any argument that we have. And so this quote comes, they attain their own kingdom, their glory, that is, should be unlimited because of the scriptural texts, they attain their own kingdom. To him all the gods offer worship, their desires are fulfilled in all the worlds. As an answer to this, however, Vyasa writes, see, without the power of ruling the universe, that is, barring the power of creation, etc., of the universe, the other powers, such as anima, etc., are acquired by the liberated. As to ruling the universe, that belongs to the eternally perfect Ishwara. As to ruling the universe, that belongs to the eternally perfect Ishwara. Why? Because he is the subject of all the scriptural texts as regards creation, etc., and the liberated souls are not mentioned in any connection with it whatsoever. And the Supreme Lord indeed is alone engaged, engaged in ruling the universe. The texts as creation, etc., all point to him. 
And besides, there is given the adjective ever perfect. And also the scriptures say that the powers, anima, etc., of the others are from the search after and the worship of God. So therefore, they have no place in the ruling of the universe. Again, on account of their possessing their own minds, it is possible that their wills may differ, and that whilst one desires creation, another may desire destruction. The only way of avoiding this conflict is to make all wills subordinate to some one will. Therefore, the conclusion is that the wills of the liberated are dependent on the will of the supreme ruler. So, devotion therein can be directed towards Brahman only in his personal aspect. The way is more difficult for those whose mind is attached to the Absolute. This is from the Bhagavad Gita. And the Bhakti, the devotee, has to float on smoothly with the current of our nature. And true it is that we cannot have any idea of the Brahman which is not anthropomorphic. But is it not equally true of everything we know? The greatest psychologist the world has ever known, don't think it's Freud or Jung or anything, it's Kapila, Bhagavan Kapila. He demonstrated ages ago that human consciousness is one of the elements in the makeup of all the objects of our perception and conception, internal as well as external, beginning with our bodies and going up to Ishwara. We may see that every object of our perception is this consciousness plus something else, whatever that may be. And this unavoidable mixture is what we ordinarily think of as reality. Indeed, it is, says Swami Vivekananda, and ever will be, all of the reality that is possible for the human mind to know. Therefore, to say that Ishwara is unreal because he is anthropomorphic is sheer nonsense. It sounds very much like the Occidental squabble on idealism and realism, which fearful looking quarrel has for its foundation a mere play on the word real. Even today in science, people are talking about, but according in, but in the real world, not understanding that they're studying Maya. The idea of Ishwara covers all the ground ever denoted and connected by the word real. And Ishwara is as real as anything else in the universe. And after all, the word real means nothing more than what has now been pointed out. Such is our philosophical conception of Ishwara. And so there's a clear distinction then. So that's a that's just to be found, by the way, as chapter um, chapter one, chapter two, I think it is. Let me just check. I think it's chapter two. In uh, you'll find it in the wonderful book Bhakti Yoga. And so this distinction between Ishwara and Brahman in the context of Bhakti Yoga, but that's the only context we can see. That's the only context that's worthwhile noting when we talk of Ishwara and when we want to find this distinction. Now, uh, I, it's a little complicated, that was it, so I'm giving you the reference. Uh, you may be a little confused by some of the philosophical, dialectical arguments going back and forth between dualism and qualified non-dualism, absolute non-dualism. So to put it in a simple phrase, Brahman is the absolute and is the substance, like the ocean. And the one creative wave, it manifests itself as the omnipresent, the omniscient, the omnipotent, the ruler of the universe, the governor, the governing, governing force, the one worthy of worshipping. In fact, the English word God comes from the Germanic hut, G-U-D, which comes from the Sanskrit hutam, the one worthy 
of making an offering to, sending our love to that, bringing the abstract absolute into the range of our response. And our response should be loving response because the swish water is lovable. It's a free giver of everything. And every manifestation we can think of is from Ishwara. And so by love of God, we get access not only to the personal Ishwara, but also the possibility of Brahman itself, that is the Absolute. There are no two. There's only in our uh, hierarchical, hierarchically arranged mind that we have two or more or others. Now there's uh, various words in various systems other than Ishwara, but yoga adopts this word, the yoga philosophy adopts this word, Ishwara, and we may equally put it as this prakriti or nature or maya, but you see the word Ishwara is significant because it means a governing force, a force that is responsible for the rhythm and harmony that we find in the universe, including our own micro-universe of the human body and mind. Well, I think we dealt with that. Uh, so if you, if you want to revisit this, I recommend you go to Swami Vivekananda's second chapter of his Bhakti Yoga. I hope this clarifies this question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Swamiji. Good, good, good. Well, I think we can leave it at that unless there are any other urgent questions. Well, have a good evening. I look forward to seeing you later in the month. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Thanks. Thank you, Vineet. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Oh.